As Bruce mentioned, Pastor Aaron and Matt will be gone the next two Sundays, which is kind of scary. And uh, I offered to preach this week also so we could do a three-part series because I was expecting that that would get me out of moving Aaron and his family because they were supposed to move yesterday. But in God's providence, they're moving tomorrow, so I'm out of excuses. Um, so I'll be there if you need me because I love you, bro. Um, this morning, we're going to begin a three-part series on a wonderful passage of Scripture. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. It's a fantastic piece of Scripture with so many rich truths. I hope that I can attempt to bring them out for us this morning so that we can understand them more fully and, and love them more dearly. If I were to give a short series title for these three messages, it would be Rejoice. Rejoice, because three times in this passage, Paul calls us to rejoice. In our passage this morning in verses 1 to 2, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And next week, we'll look at verses 3 to 5, where we rejoice in our sufferings. And finally, in verses 6 to 11, we rejoice in God. And Paul has a, a clear theme in this section that we would rejoice. And joy, rejoicing, is really a universal desire of all people. All people seek joy. They want joy. They want to be happy. There's a quote by Blaise Pascal. He once said, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause, of some, the cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. The desire for joy. God built us with this desire sin has twisted it to push us to look at all the wrong places. And when we don't find it, we despair. That's what despair is. Despair is a, a lack of being able to find joy in whatever perceived place you think it, it will come to you. God's word gives us the ultimate source of joy. And Jesus said in John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. That's why Jesus came. And this is an amazing statement because who has a greater joy than the triune God of the universe? Who's happier than God? More satisfied than God? No one. And yet Jesus said that he came that we might share in that joy. In that joy that we too could rejoice in hope of the glory of God sharing the joy of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God's word also helps us find, know where joy cannot be found. There was a wise man, perhaps you'd say a very wise man, who found out that vanity of vanities, all is vanity. God endowed Solomon with wisdom unsurpassed by any man who has ever lived before or since. And he used that wisdom and he used his wealth and he used his power to do an experiment to find joy under the sun. And he found vanity. He found vanity. The experiment continues today because we don't like learning vicariously through others. We try for ourselves. I can find it. It's got to be somewhere. And I'm looking for it in money, or fame, or power, or peace, self-indulgence, gratification, whatever, whatever it is, we try, and we try, and we try. Years ago, I was in the music industry, and music industry, entertainment industry is kind of held up as like the, it's kind of the coolest job ever. I mean, even, even pro football players wish they could be, you know, musicians, some at least. Musicians don't seem to go the other way. It's held up as this, this great desire. If you've made it in the entertainment industry, surely, surely you will have all joy. Surely you will be satisfied. But I can tell you firsthand, 
It's not there. It's not there. In fact, usually the places where we think it is the most is the, are the most hollow. The most hollow. What's your ultimate source of joy, rejoicing? Where does it come from? Does it change from day to day? Is it fleeting? Is it rooted in anything? Do we have to live a life of vanity as Christians? No, we have access to ultimate joy. Ultimate joy. By God's grace, the Christian has been given a hope that is unsurpassed and it will consume us for all eternity. Through every trial and difficulty, no one can take it from you. It comes from God. He gives it to his people. And no one can rob you of that joy. And that is the hope that's found in our passage this morning because we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now each week as we study the book of Romans chapter 5, I'd like to read the passage in its entirety. So would you please turn to Romans chapter 5 in your Bible. And we're going to read verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> this morning we'll be looking at verses 1 to 2, but we're going to read verses 1 through 11. I'll be reading in the ESV. Follow along with me. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Would you pray with me? Lord, give us wisdom this morning to see the beauty of your word, the glory of who you are. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, that we might truly understand these things. Your glory means nothing for the unregenerate, but for those you have caused to be born again, it is our joy. Be with us this morning, Lord, and let us understand these truths rightly by your Spirit. In the name of your Son we pray. Amen. So in these two short verses, there's much to unpack. And what we're going to see is that we have two benefits of justification by faith. Two benefits, and, and they should cause us to rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And they're essential to rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. The first is this in verse 1. We can rejoice in hope of the glory of God because we are at peace with God. And the second is in verse 2. We can rejoice in hope of the glory of God because we stand in grace before God. Peace with God. And we stand in grace. And those two things allow us to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, or having been justified by faith. These are, these are precious words. And if you know much about the book of Romans, they're also quite shocking words. Because Paul, in 118 to 320, just spent a lot of time condemning the whole world under the power of sin. Saying that no one is at peace with God. 
Every man and woman, Jew and Gentile, which is everyone, is under sin, which is what Romans 3, 9 says. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, and therefore under its just condemnation. And then in 3, 10 to 18, Paul gives one of the clearest descriptions of the unregenerate state of all people, those who are outside of Christ. None is righteous, no one understands, no one seeks for God, and no one fears God, which is a pretty bleak picture of humanity. And he summarizes it this way in 320, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Which leads to the next section, verse 21, but now, but now. And that section runs to the end of chapter 5 where we find our passage in 5, 1, and 2. If 118 to 320 is about the condemnation of all men, then 321 to 521 is about the justification that God offers. If 118 to 320 is about our need for God's righteousness, then 321 to 521 is about the provision of God's righteousness because sinners need a provision of righteousness. And if it's true that we're all sinners and incapable of solving our own problem before Almighty God, how is it possible that we could be justified or made right before the living God? 5.1 is the answer. Therefore, having been justified by faith, by faith. Justification is the legal declaration of a right standing before God. A declaration by God whereby he justifies you and you are right before him. And he, and he does this by declaring you and I righteous based on the righteousness of another because we've already established that my own righteousness can't do that. By works of the law, no human being will be justified. But by works of Jesus Christ, human beings can be justified. And this is just a, a summary, what he says here, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, of what he's been arguing in 321 through the end of chapter 4. He already said it, if you just flip back in your Bible, perhaps a page, to 321 and 22, he says this, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all who believe, for there is no distinction. And if you jump down to verse 28 of chapter 3, it says, For we hold that one is justified by faith, apart from works of the law. So the answer is, yes, you can be justified, but not by works. Only by faith. Only by faith. And Paul uses chapter 4 to demonstrate that with two prominent figures in Jewish history, that is Abraham and David. How was Abraham justified? Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And this all happened before circumcision. It was his faith. How about David? David, more poignantly, certainly had sin in his life, did he not? And yet, regarding David, he says, in chapter 3, let me find it. Chapter 4, sorry. 6, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Listen, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. We're sinful and our sin should be counted against us. But God imputes it to Christ on the cross for those who have faith in him and imputes his righteousness to us so that we can be justified by faith. And now we come to chapter 5, and what Paul really does is he talks about the benefits of that justification by faith. What are some of those benefits? Or the results of justification. Because we've been justified by faith, we now have peace with God. And because we've been justified by faith, we can stand in grace. 
Now, this all leads us to the title of our sermon, Rejoicing in Hope of the Glory of God. And I want to explain that because I don't want that just to be like Christian language that we hear and we say and none of us really know what we're talking about, but it sure sounds nice. Yes, rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What is that? What does it mean? Well, first, what's the glory of God? The glory of God is the outward display of all he is in his essence. Who he is on display. That's what the glory of God is. It's the shining forth of his person, his essence. And in that respect, the glory of God really is, is God. It's seeing God for who he is. So if we're going to rejoice in that, rejoice in the glory of God, what we're doing is delighting in God himself as he displays himself. You love who he is. That's what it means to rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You, can, you can't find anything better than him. It is, the sh- it is you desiring all that he is. And it fills your heart with joy when you see him on display. And this is not the first time that Paul has talked about the glory of God in the book of Romans. If you'll remember 323, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Fall short. Falling short of the glory of God is not glorifying God as we ought. He is the perfect, all-glorious God of the universe. Sin is saying, no, you're not. I'll pursue my own desires, my own pleasure, my own way. The unregenerate man hates the glory of God. In fact, that's what Romans 1.30 actually says. It says all men are haters of God. Haters of God. They don't bask or rejoice in his glory, but those who have been justified by faith rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Their hearts have been changed. You'll remember, perhaps if you were here at the beginning of the year, I taught on Isaiah 6. And Isaiah saw the glory of God, did he not? Do you remember what he did? Do you remember what he said? Woe is me. I am undone. Because you see, the glory of God is a terrifying thing for the sinner. It's not a source of joy or hope. It's a source of judgment. We can't stand in it. We can't stand in the presence of it. But for those who have peace with God and stand in grace, His glory is their greatest joy. And it should be the highest desire of every Christian. He desires God above all things. That is his hope. And this is what Christ came to accomplish in his death on the cross. Listen to what he said in John 17, 24, praying, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So to summarize this phrase, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We could say it means exalting or relishing or treasuring the fact that Christ has brought you into a right relationship with the Father so that you can be in his glory for all eternity. Psalm 1611 says, in God's presence there is fullness of joy, and that's because his glory is there and we relish in it. The reason heaven will be so wonderful is because God's glory will be there. And it is the deepest satisfaction of the human soul that has turned to him. So that's the aim that we would rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And I want to make sure we understand that. So let's look more closely at this benefit, this first one in verse 1, about peace with God. We can rejoice in hope of the glory of God because we have peace with God. This word peace, we've even mentioned it multiple times this morning. Scriptures speak of it often. It's, it's a, a precious word. It's a word that the world uses often, desires, longs for, hopes for, tries to find. Whether it's political peace, national peace, relational peace, financial peace, which just means having a lot of money. What are we talking about when we think of this word peace? Peace. Now, the word can, it can refer to a state of well-being. Maybe we would think of it as inner peace. I'm in a state of tranquility. And it does mean that. 
And in this sense, peace is subjective. And what I mean by subjective is that it's a sense or a feeling. I feel at peace. But there's another kind of peace that the scriptures talk about, and it's objective. It's an objective peace. It's the, the kind of peace that is opposite to a state of war or conflict. It's the absence of strife or enmity. It's harmony between two parties. And here's the difference between objective and subjective peace. Objective peace, for example, our country could be at war with another country. And objectively, we are not at peace. But you may have a sense of inner peace, a subjective sense of peace, depending on how it affects you. Or the other way around, we might not be at war with another country objectively, but you might subjectively be absolutely not at peace in your heart, but full of anxiety. And this is true of our relationship with God. There are people who think they are objectively at peace with God, and, and they're not, but they don't feel any, any lack of peace. They think they're okay with God. There are times where Christians who are objectively right with God don't feel it. And I believe the scriptures do speak to both and salvation does provide both. God actually provides both objective peace and subjective peace. But what Paul is dealing with here is objective peace. Objective peace. That the enmity between God and me is no longer there. This is a relational peace because notice this is, this is peace with God. It's with a person. It's not just a sense that I have. And if you just jump down to verse 10, although we'll cover this in two weeks, it says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. You see, we were enemies. We were not at peace, but now we are at peace. Before you were saved, you were an enemy of God. You were not at peace with him. You were at war with him. God is the enemy of everyone who has not placed their faith in Christ to be justified. Psalm 711 says, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. God is mad every day with sinners. He is their enemy and they are his. There is no peace. Now, I wonder how often we pause and think about this. It's not uh, the easiest thing to think about. It's not perhaps the happiest thing to think about, but it's essential to think about because it's the means by which we turn to Christ for salvation. Can you imagine anything more terrifying than the infinite, all-powerful, all-glorious, holy God of the universe being your enemy. He's against you and he has all power to work against you. A lot of people, if they believe in him, are scared of Satan. And they're scared of him because they think he's more powerful than they are. And that's true. He's more powerful than you. But God can inflict more wrath in perfect justice than Satan ever could in unrighteousness. Nothing is more terrifying than the God of the universe being against you. And that is the state of every human soul outside of faith in Christ. And we have to know where we stand before him. That's why Paul belabored the fact from 118 to 320 to demonstrate that very thing. Jesus said, don't fear him who can destroy the body, that is Satan, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell, that is God. He's the only one with the power to do that. And the question is, where do you stand with God objectively? Are you his enemy or are you at peace? If you stand under your own works, as Romans 3.20 says, 
no human being will be justified in his sight. No justification, no peace. Are you looking for another way? Perhaps there's another way you can, you can find a right relationship with God. Only when we rest wholly in the righteousness of Jesus can we be at peace with the God of the universe. Bruce read earlier from Philippians 3, 9, which said, and be found in him, that is Christ, having a righteousness of, not of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. We have no righteousness of our own that commend us, can commend us to God. And if that's true, what, what should we do if we're in that state? What should we do? How can you have peace with God? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Repent of your unrighteousness that can never commend you to God and throw yourself on the mercy of God that comes through Jesus Christ. And then you'll experience that word peace, the beauty of that word. You can imagine, perhaps in one of the first or second world wars, living through that conflict, and finally there comes a day where it comes to an end. And every newspaper, front page, prints a headline with one word in all caps, PEACE. Those who have been at conflict recognize the value of peace. But not just peace in this world, peace with Almighty God. Peace with Almighty God. No more enmity, no more separation, no more fear of judgment, no more condemnation. Do you see now why peace allows us to rejoice in hope of the glory of God? When we're at peace with him, his glory becomes our joy because no longer will be the source of condemnation for us. It's the source of righteousness and salvation for all eternity. And remember, this is all, as the end of verse 1 says, through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all through our Lord Jesus Christ, the only means by which we can have peace with God. Everything good we experience, and even our desire to rejoice in the glory of God, is through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace is a benefit of being justified by faith. There's another benefit here that we see in our passage in verse 2. And that is standing in grace before God. Verse 2 says, Through him, that is Christ, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Standing in grace allows us to rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This same word, have, we have obtained access, is the same word, have peace with God. Except that in this case, the, the word have and the word stand are in a, the perfect tense. And the perfect tense is used to describe something that happened in the past and it has ongoing implications today. So it happened that we had grace, but we stand in it ongoing. We need peace and grace. Peace and grace. Because remember, if Romans 1, 18 to 3, 20 is true, and I'm not righteous, how can I have peace with God? Only through grace. Because grace is unmerited favor, and works is merited favor. So if you want the merit due you because of your works, it's judgment. That's your only option, to stand before God. But if it's by grace, then it can come not from you, but through our Lord Jesus Christ and this is something Paul's already been demonstrating in, in Romans chapter 3 and 4. And that is that there are only two options for salvation, as works or grace. And they're mutually exclusive. You can have one or you can have the other. If Again, perhaps if you flip back or just look back in chapter 4, if you looked at verses 13 to 16, it says this. 
Romans 4, 13. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are be, to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Verse 16, that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Grace and works are opposite of each other. Which one do you want to stand under? Grace, not works. If we jumped ahead to Romans eleven six, 6, we would see the same point. But if it is by grace, that is being chosen by God, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So remember, here's the conclusion. Works is merited favor. Grace is unmerited favor. And it's only by grace that we can stand before the living God, once wicked sinners, now at peace with God, having been justified by faith in him. There are two other very important words in verse 2. That is the word access in the ESV. And the second is stand. The NASB translate this first word access to we have obtained our introduction. Obtained our introduction. And I think both are essentially communicating the same thing. If you've obtained an introduction into something, you have access to it. And it's this idea that we've gained access, introduction into something that we previously didn't have. And this comes through Jesus Christ. Paul only uses this word two other times, both in the book of Ephesians. And in one of them, in Ephesians 3.12, he said this, in whom, that is Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Same idea. Faith gives us access into this grace in which we stand. And it's very important, I think, that we remember to the original reader what this would mean, particularly to the original Jewish reader. Because when you think back about the Old Covenant and the tabernacle system and the temple system, what was so on display was that you did not have access to God. It was the, the tabernacle and temple were there so that God could dwell in the midst of his people, yes. But who could go into the Holy of Holies? Only the high priest. And how often? Only once a year. And they tied a bell around him and a rope to make sure that if he died in service, they could pull him out because nobody else could go in. So the idea was, no, we're barred from this access. We don't have free access to just walk into God's presence whenever we want. But listen to these words. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. That is a glorious reality because at the death of Christ, what happened to that veil? was torn from top to bottom because it was God's doing to say the way is available. Access to God is here through our Lord Jesus Christ. The doors are open. The doors of our prison cell held captive by our sin have been broken and the doors of heaven so that we can have a citizenship in heaven have been opened for us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you, can you believe that? I think we take it for granted sometimes. Oh yes, isn't it? Yes, God saves sinners. Why? Why does he do that? Grace upon grace. And speaking of grace upon grace, he uses the word stand. We stand in grace. And, and this is just staggering, I think. Because really what we should be doing is falling on our face being judged by him. That's what our sin deserves. But we get to stand in his presence. Stand in the grace of God. And there's a security here that is unsurpassed. Because I'm not standing based on my own merit. I'm standing based on Jesus Christ. I'm standing based on the grace that was extended to me. I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. God gives it to those who put their faith in Jesus. 
This access is purchased by the perfect Son of God. And as long as the Father is pleased with the Son, guess what? He will be pleased with you for all eternity. Nothing can take that away. Hebrews 4.16 says, the same idea of drawing near access. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's only by the grace of God that this could happen. So we come back to where we started. Rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. What are you rejoicing in? What are you rejoicing in? Well, if you've been justified by faith and you're at peace with God and you stand in grace, then his glory becomes your ultimate joy. And it is easy for us to lose our focus, is it not? To get lost in the things of this world. We take our eyes off the heavenly things and we fix our eyes on earthly things. But the truths of this passage remind us that it is only through our Lord Jesus Christ that we can have peace with God, that we can stand in grace. And that makes his glory our ultimate hope. Would you want to go to heaven if God wasn't there? If you do, you've not been justified by faith. Anybody would want their own version of what a, eternal bliss and joy would look like, whether that's golf or a beach or whatever. But the joy of heaven is the glory of God. The joy of the saint is the glory of God. He desires it. He pursues after it. And he recognizes the amazing gift that what I deserved was eternal separation from him. Away from the presence of his glory and now, I get to spend eternity in his presence, God dwelling with his people. I hope that we can fix our eyes back on that because remember, one day, one day, only through our Lord Jesus Christ, we will be in his presence. We will be in the presence of his glory and we will be able to stand because of Jesus. That is our great hope. We will be with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit forever because of the grace of our God and Savior through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's press on each day toward that hope that one day for those who have been justified by faith, they will be with God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, such wonderful truths that you've put in your word. And if we would just take the time to reflect, we would be amazed anew that we who were unrighteous didn't seek you, didn't fear you. That we could have peace with you. It's through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's his robes for mine. He took my wrath and gave me his righteousness. And he's done that for every child of God. Every child of God here. And Lord, if there are those who are not your children, who are your enemies, would your spirit shine forth the light of the gospel, of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, who takes captives from their cell of sin and makes them children of the kingdom, sets them free. And those whom the Son sets free are free indeed. Thank you for your unmeasured, amazing grace. We give all glory to you, our Father, and it is our joy to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.